Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome. My name is Stefan Bergmans. I'm the Director for Research and Innovation at the European University Association. Welcome to this webinar. Uh, it is part of a webinar series on universities and the future of scholarly publishing. Today, we'll be fo uh, focusing, as you can see from the title, on transformative agree agreements and where this is leading us. So let me right away insist on the fact that, of course, this is part of a webinar series, uh, as I was saying. So three weeks ago, we started by looking into the unknown. So really, what were the most likely future for open access uh, publishing? Two weeks ago, uh, we looked into universities as the promises for scholar-led publishing. Of course, today we're looking at uh, transformative agreements. I'd like to insist on the fact that if you missed one of the previous webinar, please be aware they are recorded and they're available on the EUA YouTube channel. Uh, on the 15th of June, we will be following with the fourth and last of our webinars. It will be a membership only webinar that will get really practical. So we'll look at the, into the alignment uh, of institutional policies with planets. But today, we really want to focus on transformative agreement. What I'd like to start with is uh, a poll. So I'm going to ask you to go to menti.com. And uh, when you're there, you can use the code 6702-0267-6702-0267. And I'm going to ask you actually to keep uh, menti.com open throughout actually my presentation today, my introduction, because that's, that's going to be uh, uh, it's going to be uh, used several times. So um, if we could have now up the Menti slides, thank you. It's coming up. What we'd like to understand actually uh, a little bit is who you are. Um, and hmm, I don't see it right now. So I'm just quickly going to... Because really what we want to be able to do, there you go, it's coming. So apologies for this uh, slight delay. What we'd like to understand is who you are. So we'd like to uh, ask you what your area of activity uh, is, what your professional sector is. So uh, again, using this menti, we'd like to better understand. Uh, so are you from universities? Oh, okay. So uh, someone is highlighting to me indeed that the code seems to have changed. So please, apologies for this change, but it's 6093-2509, 6093-2509. And you have it there also in the chat if you need to see that. Okay, so we'd like to understand better uh, who you are. And that's why what I'm asking you here is basically, are you from universities, for example? Are you from a consortium? Are you from uh, funders? Are you a policymaker? Uh, and of course, you can always hit others. Unfortunately, at this point, I cannot see. There you go. So I'm seeing that the voting is closed. I'm wondering if there's some issues there. There you go. It's now open for voting. So please go ahead. Uh, very sorry about this little cock up. Now it's voting. I see that one person already voted, oh, but the voting is closed again. Ah, I see the votes are coming now. Thank you very much. So again, are you from the sector? Are you from the universities or research performing organizations? Are you from a consortium, publisher? Are you from a research funding organizations, good policy maker, and then of course the option of other. And I can see now that more than 80 people have voted and we have an overwhelming participation of people coming from universities and, and research performing organizations, followed by, but well behind, behind that publishers. I can see that it's slowly stabilizing. We're getting to the hundreds so I don't think that new votes are going to change anything. So yes, overwhelmingly, participants are from universities. Well, good. For those who answered that they were from universities, we'd like to know who you are, so what your role and position. 
Are you a university leader, a rector, a vice rector? Are you directors or heads of research support departments or heads of uh, uh, libraries, for example? So there you go. So we've got overwhelmingly for the moment out of the 21st that voted, but that's more votes are coming. Uh, librarians actually, support staff, followed by directors of libraries. So yes, it seems that we've got quite a lot of people from the library, research support staff also. Let's wait a little more, but I don't think that the trend is going to change tremendously now. Good. Yes, it's stabilized. So I, I propose, thank you. So we now know who is attending uh, this uh, webinar. So that's very good. Thank you very much for that. And please keep in mind, we'll move ahead, but Menti will be used again. So keep it open uh, with the same code, not the one you see here, obviously. So what I'd like to do now is to, before we have the intervention of our panelists, five panelists, and the discussion that will follow, I'd like to set the scene. And to do that, I'd like to highlight um, a, provide you highlights from the EUA uh, report on read and publish. So this was a study that was published back in July, 2020. And just to quickly summarize, the objective of that study was really to get a, a good view uh, across the sector into the possible, the short-term, but also the long-term implications of the publish and read system that, was, that had emerged actually, and some of its alternative. Very quickly, a very short summary, but I would urge you to go in and, and, and read the report itself. Uh, here, the results are just a very short summary. In the short term, it's clear that the survey was showing that transformative deals were there to be just in the short term, because in the long term, what was desired was actually to have open access platforms. And when looking at those open access platforms, the results show that realistically, those were going to be publisher owned, but at least to start with, because the desire and more long term is probably to have a community owned series of open access platform. So that's overall what the report was showing. Uh, quickly, uh, just to be clear, what do we mean by transformative agreements? Here we're talking about a definition. So, of course, this is an umbrella term. And it's describing those agreements between, uh, you know, that uh, institutions are, what I mean institution, libraries, national and regional consortium that are actually being negotiated with publishers. And this is about how to transform the former subscription expenditure to be repurposed to support open access publishing. So really what we're talking about is transforming the business model that is underlying the scholarly publishing uh, um, and here, what the idea is, is to gradually, but very importantly, definitively, shifting from one that is based on subscription, so total access, to one where publishers are actually paid a fair price for the services that they would provide in open access publishing. And I insist here on the word services. This is, uh, just so you know, coming from the ESAC initiative website, this definition. Uh, looking back at the Berlin Open Access Conference that took place in 2018, participants there are really committed uh, to the fact that authors should retain their copyright, but also committed to complete and immediate open access. So there, they were all committed to actually accelerating the progress of open access. And this was through transformative agreements. This conference looked very specifically at transformative agreements, but they understood and they clearly stated that they should be temporary and in a transition because the idea was to shift to the full open access within just a few years. The other important element here is that these agreements should, at least initially, be cost neutral. So as a result of this conference and those commitments, publishers are of course expected to work with all members of the global research community to put in place to affect the complete and immediate open access according to the statement. Of course, what do we mean? There's been a somewhat evolution in uh, the transformative agreements. First, we're, we're talking about read and publish. So here we're talking about prepaid publishing fee with immediate open access publishing and relatively small reading fee. The focus was really on 
cost control. And so this is a shift from the cost from reading to a cost to the publishing. Then emerge also the publish and read arguments. So here we're talking about a lunstum that was disaggregated where the cost here was expressed now per article and really as a par fee. We're still talking about immediate open access publishing. We're still talking about a relatively small reading fee, but here the par fees are paid really centrally. Uh, and this is for each uh, and every single article uh, that were being published. So what do those scenarios actually mean in terms of their properties? Well, open access, uh, of course, accommodated within one contract. So you have one big contract that includes actually the open access. And this includes, of course, the reading of non-open access articles, but also the publishing of open access article. And outside of these contracts, let's face it, there's still paywalls. So there was paywall papers with embargoes and delayed open access. So we're talking about open access publishing. The publishers clearly dominate the scholarly publishing uh, system. And so this means that today they're earning both from uh, uh, open access publishing, but also still from subscription. So the question that I will be putting also to the, the panel later uh, right away is, is this really uh, real steps towards full open access? Uh, because that's a question that's still uh, pending. What is the effect, what is the impact of transformative agreements in the last few years since they've emerged? Well, clearly, and you can see here uh, some examples. This is, again, coming from the ESAC initiative. Uh, and you can see over the last few years the impact that it has. I don't have the time to go into full details, but you can see that given we have a panelist uh, from Germany, another one from Ireland, you can see that in Germany, just for 2021, those transformative agreements are responsible, actually, for more than 24,000 open access articles. In Ireland, uh, we're talking for 2021, more than 3,000 uh, articles in open access that are the results of those transformative agreements. So let's go back to the Menti, and we're going to see now the, the new... Uh, the new poll uh, coming up, because what we'd like to ask you is what you think about the risks and the weaknesses about those transformative agreements. So first, let's focus uh, on uh, the strength, actually, of those. You see seven uh, uh, strengths here, and I'd like you to uh, rank those. And again, you can see that uh, the, the code has changed, so please make sure that the code is the one that you, you see right there, 6093. 2509, 6093, 2509. And the ranking of the strengths that you can choose from are cost transparency, more immediate open access for all stakeholders, cost control, less administration for the researcher, reduced overall, oh, it's changing already, great, reduced overall cost, gradual disappearance of subscription model, and better visibility of research outputs. I see one person who has voted, Again, reminder, 6093-2509. There you go. More people are coming and voting. Good. Cost transparency currently is on the top there. Oh, no. Interesting. Less than duration for researchers. And again, the reason we're asking you this is because, of course, this was also part of the survey that we did and where those questions were asked to those people from the community who were asked. I see it's still going up a little bit. Good. So more immediate open access for all stakeholders seems to be there on top, followed by better visibility of research outputs, followed by cost transparency. Interestingly, knowing the report myself and knowing the results, I can see that this fits very well, and we'll see that later with actually the results of our survey. Wonderful, good to know. Thank you, I think it's stabilizing now. Excellent. Let's move on to the next one. So it's still ranking, but now we're going to ask you about, of course, the weaknesses. So you can see here questions that were also asked in the report about weaknesses of those transformative agreement. So you see at top here, but again, it's not yet ranked. Cost increase, 
monopoly of large publishers, less competition, reinforcement of high impact factor, reduced access to open access publication from less developed regions, risk of locking out new players. And what we're showing you there again is the new code, 6093-2509. Oh, there you go. It has started. Wonderful. Great. Good. For now, with nine votes, 11 votes, Monopoly of Large Publishers is on top. Again, right after that, I'll be able to show you the results actually coming out of our survey. But you, we just want to see from this crowd attending this webinar today, if we see something similar. Good. Monopoly is clearly staying on top there. That's not going to move. We're reaching the uh, high number of votes, so that's good. Perfect. We're almost there. So yes, we can see out on top the monopoly of large publishers, followed in this case by cost increase, and then risk of lacking, locking out new players and lack of innovation. So we're talking, for example, societies in this case. Then the danger of small publishers, like learned societies indeed, and uncertainty due to the tr transition nature of research and publish, uh, read and publish agreements, and then the two others. Good, perfect. We're at uh, almost 100. Thank you very much for your vote. We'll keep all this information, of course, but thanks a lot. Let's move back then to the end of my presentation so that we can move on also to the panel, uh, to the panelist. So here comes the slides. Great. So uh, here are the um, results. Actually, you can see that there's quite an agreement actually on the vote we got today with the results from the survey that we have in the uh, read and publish report and uh, from the art survey. So here on top, you can see that more immediate open access available uh, is perfectly in agreement. Same thing for better visibility of research output to all. Cost transparency quite high, and you can see the whole series there. I'm not going to read that, of course. So good agreement between uh, the uh, attendants today uh, for this survey. And then same thing, monopoly. When looking at weaknesses, monopoly is right on top there. Same thing followed by cost increase. And then you can see risk of locking out new player. So quite interesting that you've got a perfectly uh, parallel uh, results from the survey, uh, from the report and uh, the crowd that we have here today. So wonderful. With that, I'd like to thank you all uh, very much for your attention for this short in introduction. What I'd like to do now is move on to our panelists. We've got a series of five um, distinguished panelists. Uh, and they will represent uh, somewhat different parts, actually, of the community when it comes to transformative agreement. Uh, first, first, to represent a consortium, we've got Jens Peter Gold, who's the Secretary General of the German Rector's Conference, HRK. From another consortium in Ireland, we've got Jack Highland, uh, who's uh, the IRL manager for Maynooth Universities. For, from a traditional, let's say, publisher, we've got Liz Ferguson, who's the Vice President open research at Wiley. Uh, from a not-for-profit community publisher, we've got uh, Claire Moulton, who's a publisher at the uh, Company of Biologists. And finally, from an open access publisher, but also an open science platform, we've got uh, Stefan Kuster, who's the head of institutional relations at Frontiers. And what we'll do is uh, we'll start with Jens Peter, uh, who has been the Secretary General of the German Rectors Conference, so HRK, since January 2016. And his position, uh, Jens Peter, has been uh, involved in the DEAL project in Germany, in which uh, nationwide transformative publish and read ag agreements are being negotiated with the largest commercial publishers. Uh, and this is on behalf of all uh, German academic institutions, including universities, universities of applied sciences, research institution, state and regional libraries. In his previous position, uh, Jan Speer uh, was the director of the European Liaison Office of German Research Organization, COVI, 
uh, in Bonn and in Brussels. So Jens Peter, the floor is you. You've got five minutes. I will turn off my camera and come back one mi minute before the end so that you can uh, you know when your time is almost up. Uh, Jens Peter, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Stefan. I hope um, everyone can hear me. Um, a big hello and thank you very much to EUA for organizing it and uh, for my fellow panelists here um, to join me on that panel and a big hello into the community. It's a heavy topic we are on um, today, uh, but a very rewarding too. Um, <clears throat> just a few remarks for kind of warm up from, from my side, um, touching on several of the, the questions that were raised. Um, and uh, adding some remarks to my first <clears throat> remark would be that um, our transformative agreements um, are transformative agreements um, given that they work um, now only speaking for the deal consortium with a with a parfi it's a quite a common model and so they are marked as being transformative but beside that um, they have uh, and it's important to keep that in mind, many, many elements that are not transformative, but are more or less like foreshading or um, representing um, the current um, and upcoming open access, fully open access contracts. So uh, if you have a transformative agreement, you have to agree about um, data issues. You have to agree about copyright issues. You have to agree about the scope of the portfolio. You have uh, to agree about the payment issues and so everything that's in these transformative agreements is um, is essential for every upcoming contract and so uh, it's good to keep in mind that uh, if you start negotiating these contracts um, it does not make sense to say uh, we want to have a transformative agreement and then forget or leave out some of the important issues. So, um, and what was also highlighted in, um, in the short poll we had this also, the transformative agreements have a strong effect on open access publishing. Um, just talking about Germany, so we started uh, with about 1,000 open access um, articles in 2018, and we've reached, uh, together with our partners from Wiley and Springer Nature, about 25,000 um, in the beginning of 2021. <clears throat> this was my first remark. Second one is, <clears throat> from my experience, I would say that <clears throat> there are three things you need if you want to be, or there are many things you need, but let's highlight three one if you want to be successful. One is, and that was also part of the polls, is that, uh, or, the, or part of the study, is you need a strong leadership support. Um, that's why we set up the deal consortium at the highest political level. Um, and uh, this is very important. But keep in mind that you're all aware of that, that universities are kind of, let's say, organisms. So you should not overestimate that effect. We have the libraries, which play an absolutely key role, a crucial role in, in the whole issue. We have the departments, we have the scientists, we have the students, and within the university, a lot of different interests and sometimes pressure groups. So leadership support helps a lot, um, but it does not um, make it um, unnecessary to have a clear look at the other groups involved. Um, the second thing you need is a strong operational entity uh, for the deal consortium. It's a deal entity. It's the MPDL, Max Planck Digital Library Service, um, GMBH. Um, that's a, um, that's a, uh, a, a legal figure from the German law. And you, you have to need a very strong, we have a good one. We have a very strong one, very professional one. And you absolutely need that as you are dealing with uh, multi-million dollar players on the other end of the table. The second thing you really need is you need not only the leadership support, but um, at least talking for the relatively large German system, you need all this government support, um, at least in these large systems. You have always issues of cash flow redistribution. Uh, in Germany, it's between the federal government and uh, the regional governments, the lender who are in charge of the universities. And there's a lot of legal decision making involved. That would be my second part. So the things you need. The last one is um, cost control. Uh, cost control is absolutely important. <laughs> Everyone would agree to that. But what does it mean, cost control? And uh, if you look at it closely, there's a big, big difference between the issue if you're talking about nominal cost control, let's say, make publishing cheaper, to put it bluntly, or are you talking about cost control in the sense of 
added value recalculated as money. It's a big discussion in Germany. Are the contracts more expensive or have they become even cheaper? And cost control is a big issue in that. And it really depends on, uh, on from what perspective you look at that. My last remark, um, what are the indicators for cost control? Um, you have to keep in mind that at least in the German system, we're still stuck with a kind of input parameters. So we're still talking about cost per article, cost per publication, not about, let's say, output parameters like cost per download or something like that. So um, seeing Stefan here, knowing my time is up, uh, I'll leave with these with three uh, starting remarks. Thank you very much for inviting me and looking forward to our webinar. Thanks. Thank you very much and thanks for keeping the time. Our next speaker is uh, Jack Hyland. So he serves as the uh, manager for uh, IRO. Uh, that's a nationally funded uh, e-resource licensing consortium providing access to uh, leading science, technology and medicine, but also humanities and social sciences resources on behalf of the participating Irish publicly funded higher education uh, institution. So Jack is also the editorial board member of DBS Business Review, an open access peer review academic journal published by the Dublin Business School. So Jack, the floor is yours and you have five minutes. Hey, thank you very much. Hi, everyone. In 2019, the IRL Consortium, the Irish Consortium, had agreements with 27 journal publishers, and all of those were read-only subscription agreements. And in the last 15 months, since around the time of the pandemic, but not directly related to it, um, Arl had signed um, 20 transformative agreements with these publishers. Uh, negotiations are continuing with the remaining publishers. So two years ago, uh, Ireland had no presence on the ESAC registry of transformative agreements. And today, the ESAC Market Watch places Ireland seventh of 32 countries monitored in terms of the percentage of papers published immediately open access. Um, most of this for Ireland, um, over 50% of our article output, is driven by these 20 transformative agreements. So I think there's three key points of interest to the audience that uh, from our situation in Ireland. First, while transformative agreements are challenging to negotiate with the right alignment, a country, a country can roll these out relatively quickly. There's a lot of extra work involved, but it's extra work for a small number of people to make open access as easy as possible for a very large number of researchers. A uh, second point is that uh, transformative agreements are not only for the major publishers. Uh, IRL has agreements with the top 10 publishers, but also with many small nonprofit publishers, such as the Royal Irish Academy, Company of, Bi of Biologists, and the Microbiology Society. Indeed, it's often been these smaller publishers who would be more willing and be more responsive in being able to meet our needs. Um, the final point is that for us, transformative agreements um, haven't been lending themselves. They've been, for us, a gateway to funding open access. They've set a precedent in committing a growing percentage of our budget to open access. So new subscription deals in RL are unlikely now. And we're open to spreading our bets and how we spend this open access money annually. Um, so while it's not just it, it's not just transformative agreements, and it shouldn't be. Recently, the Arrow Consortium also joined the Scope Three initiatives and annual reviews subscribed to Open Pilot. We're in negotiations with fully open access publishers, and we're reviewing our options for supporting other open access initiatives. So transformative agreements have been expanding our options, not locking us into that one business model. Um, there are limits to what you can do to, to what transformative agreements can be expected to achieve. They will not solve the wider related issues in scholarly publishing on their own, uh, such as the, the journal level assessment, such as the various perverse incentives, um, over emphasis on the article as a primary output. So transformative agreements won't solve these, but in the short to medium term, uh, these issues will not be solved by continuing, continuing subscription funding, or they won't be solved by walking away from big deals. Transformative agreements have already been successful in triggering a shift from spending on closed access to open access and doing this in an open and transparent way. In the medium to long term, this should complement and further complement and enable further innovations in scholarly publishing. Thank you. You caught me by surprise there. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Thank you so much. <laughs> Wonderful. Thanks, Jack. Uh, next, we have Liz Ferguson, who's the vice president 
uh, of open research uh, at Wiley. So her team leads uh, open access uh, for Wiley. So this includes strategies and business models for innovative open access uh, agreements. Previously, Liz uh, uh, was actually worked uh, as vice president of editorial development and publishing solutions uh, as director at Wiley. So prior to joining Wiley, Liz uh, worked at Blackwell uh, and other leading uh, publishers. Liz, uh, the floor is yours and you've got five minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Stefan. And thanks to you, to Vansian and Orly for the invitation as well. Um, now, more than ever, in all these many years in publishing now, feels like the most dynamic time since I've been in the industry. And my, my boss, who's been around just that little bit longer than me, is very fond of saying that the changes we're all experiencing now um, really make the shift from print to digital just look like the warm-up act. So I'm going to spend the next five minutes or fewer talking about TAs um, from the perspective of a large publisher with reference to the EUA study. Um, as a bit of preamble, we've been operating what are now considered transitional or transformative agreements thanks to the foresight of some early movers in the Netherlands and Austria since 2014. The TAs that we now have in place cover more than a thousand institutions and last year we published um, in excess of 20,000 open access articles under the terms of these agreements as well as about 35,000 outside. Primarily, our agreements are of the read and publish variety, um, and the big outstanding exception is, is the publish and read agreement with Deal in Germany. Stefan and, and others have already given a good overview of those, so I won't go further, but I think it's important to note that both of those models meet the conditions of the fee transitioning to publishing, increasingly to publishing over time, Capped or not, there is a substantial and immediate increase in the amount of OA publishing available, and all of our TA agreements don't contain NDAs and are available on the ESAC website. I was very glad um, with the outcome of the survey because I've prepared some comments based on the first three headline findings from the EUA report. One of those is that the transformative scenario can deliver more immediate open access than the other scenarios that were presented in, in the study. That's certainly our experience. If Wiley, as the third largest publisher, delivers a transitional agreement or a transformative one together with a consortium, um, we can turn thousands of articles open access in any given year. And for a smaller consortium, it will still be a sizable proportion of their research output. So there's purely a volume related angle to whether these agreements can deliver more. I also argue there's probably a, a cultural and behavioral dynamic to it, which is that authors can continue to publish in the venues that they've long valued. Um, so you're not asking them to make more than one shift at any one time. They should just start to see the benefits of OA um, in, in the community journals that they've, they've long treasured. So another headline finding, and Stefan referred to this earlier, is the perceived weakness that transitional agreements prolong the market position of the largest publishers. So I've got to say this is not entirely within our hands. Of course, we're going to talk with and work with any customer who wants to work with us. And I increasingly hope that we're showing by our actions that while we may not agree on all of the details all of the time, those of us in market leading positions can make a really constructive contribution to the transition. Jack has already illustrated in his opening comments the speed with which the consortia can move and also the variety of agreements they can pick up. We, we're bringing 600 societies to the table every time we, we execute a transitional agreement. The ESAC database has agreements with more than or nearly 50 different publishers in it, publishing anything from one to 10,000 articles in a year. Um, so there is diversity in the market. There is more to be had. There's lots of willingness to experiment on the part of publishers, large and small, as well as consortia, large and small equally. So I would say transitional agreements are certainly not in any respect the preserve or cementing the position of the big four or five. I also want to touch briefly on the second uh, potential strength, which was benefits for researchers and societies at large as a consequence of greater visibility of, of research. So the benefit of transitional agreements is often and rightly measured by how much publishing is open. But we've also seen good outcomes for readership. So when in the first year of our deal agreement, we saw a 43% increase in usage within institutions eligible for that agreement. 
Um, so we're seeing increase of, increasing visibility of research within the institutions that benefit. We've also just completed some work and we'll be publishing this later this week as a report um, and I'll, I'll make a link available at some point. Um, as a large publisher, we have a big body of evidence and we looked at 200,000 articles with at least four years of history. And we can demonstrate now hybrid open access articles got four times as many downloads as subscription articles, gold open access twice as many, open access articles were cited twice as often, and there's a whole load of other interesting stuff. And I'm going to close now by saying we've learned a huge amount over the past few years working with and talking um, to the consortia that we're partnered with. These kinds of opportunities are tremendously valuable, so I'm very pleased to be here. Looking forward to a good discussion. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Liz. And yes, lots to talk about. So next is uh, Claire Moulton. She is publisher at the Company of Biologists. Uh, this is a not-for-profit publishing organization that's dedicated to supporting and inspiring the biological, uh, biological uh, community. So hosting scientific meetings and providing a wide range of uh, charitable grants to support the community. In her previous position, uh, Claire worked as Elsevier as publishing manager and publisher for journals I used to read a long time ago, Current Opinions, Trends, uh, and Drug Discovery uh, Today review titles. So uh, Claire, thank you very much. And the floor is here for five minutes. Thank you. Can you all hear me OK? Good. Um, so I'm going to be talking about how the company biologist is using read and publish agreements alongside transformative journal status. Um, we're a not-for-profit uh, publisher with five journals. Three are hybrid, now transformative journals, and two are fully open access journals. Um, since 2019, we've been part of the SPA Ops initiative, working with librarians and funders to explore transparency and different transformative models. In 2020, uh, in addition to implementing our new read and publish agreements, we were the first publisher ever to be afforded transformative journal status by Plan S. So a transformative journal must make a public commitment to transition to full open access as soon as possible and no later than when 75% of the journal's content um, is OA. The journal must grow its share of open access content each year by at least 5% and produce an annual report to show the progress. It should be clear to subscribers that the pricing has been offset to avoid any perception of double dipping and the journal must promote the benefits of open access. Um, so uh, Liz shared some uh, metrics for them. I can tell you that we have been measuring um, comparative metrics for our open access versus our subscription content. And our open access articles are read at least twice as often as our non-OA articles. In terms of our read and publish agreements, uh, we've already heard how they work. So I'd like to emphasize the importance of transparent pricing and explain the benefits of uncapped agreements. So that includes uncapped reader access to all of our content, but more importantly, it means that corresponding authors from participating institutions can publish an unlimited number of articles, open access, without paying an OA fee. This means there's no threshold that changes the deal during the course of the year, giving authors and institutions more certainty. We've had great feedback from librarians about our willingness to trial new models to transition towards OA. Individual institutions want a simple addendum to their existing contract to make this switch as easy as possible into a read and publish agreement. Consortia want us to be more flexible, as mentioned. For example, most focus on our three hybrid journals, but others want to include our two open access journals as well. Most want cost free processes for their authors, and we've worked really hard on a pain free workflow. But others prefer a shared funding model if authors already have alternative funding routes. As you'd expect, we've had fantastic feedback from authors. They love being able to publish OA without having to find the funds to pay an APC. They often talk about a department pot for OA money that they're not sure how to access. And in fact, there's a rumor that it's already run out. So the read and publish agreement comes as a relief and very welcome news. And it's important to us that these benefits are available to a broad range of authors. So we're particularly pleased that we've recently announced an agreement with Eiffel that will help us to support authors from developing and transition economies. So we see the transformative journal approach and the read and publish agreements as working very much hand in hand. The read and publish agreements help us grow our percentage of open access, which will fulfill our transformative journal commitment. And the transformative journal status gives us more time while we are compliant with the funder mandates for our authors 
to grow our read and publish coverage across institutions for our authors. So what results are we seeing? Over the past decade, um, two of our journals had grown to around 50 to 20 percent open access, but our third journal has never got above four percent. Uh, it has the same policies and the same APCs as the other two journals, but the funders in this area just haven't mandated open access or provided funds for APCs. So in 2021, we have more than 200 institutions in 17 countries participating in read and publish agreements. And I can tell you that as a result, the open access content on our third journal has already increased from 4% to around 14%. So to sum up, um, there are definitely positives about our approach. Transformative journals mean that we're compliant with funder mandates. Read and publish agreements mean that we've got happy librarians and very happy authors. It aligns with our mission to support biologists and it also secures a baseline income for quality publishing for the coming years. But there are definitely challenges as well. Um, articles using the rights retention route won't count towards our target. Um, read and publish agreements are incredibly time consuming. There's lots of manual work, so we've had to expand our team and increase our costs. And it can be hard to gain attention when you're a small not-for-profit organisation. So I would like to finish by thanking those librarians who've put aside time as well as money to support us in that endeavour. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Claire. Interesting figures there you were sharing also. Uh, we'll have to talk about that later also. Thanks. Uh, next, we've got uh, Stefan Kuster. Uh, he's the head of institutional relation at Frontiers. So that's an open access publisher, but also an open science uh, platform. So Frontiers publishes peer review open access scientific journals, uh, currently active in science, technology, and medicine. Previously, uh, Stefan was the Secretary General of Science Europe, the European Association representing uh, the interests of major public research performing, uh, but also research funding organizations. So, uh, Stefan, it's your turn, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Stefan. Uh, hello, everyone, and thank you to the EUA for inviting me as, as part of this diverse panel. Uh, it's important to have diversity of views on this issue of uh, transformative agreements. Like many fully open access publishers, Frontiers was started by scientists who were frustrated with paywalls in scholarly communication. And we have always been driven by this sense of mission of making science open. So from that perspective, any move towards more open access is a move in the right direction. And any agreement that leads to more open access is something to be supported in principle. However, <laughs> there are clearly some concerns about the effects of the current focus on transformative agreements and doubts about whether the transformation is happening quickly enough. The focus on transformation, meaning significant budgetary and policy effort being made to transform paywalled content published with a group of large traditional legacy publishers into open access has the risk of perpetuating some of the very fe features of the current system we would like to see change. And uh, I was not surprised to see the outcome of the, of the poll, uh, uh, of the Mentimeter poll you just conducted of, of the audience of this webinar, uh, and also uh, of the result of recent studies, including the study that the EOA commissioned. Uh, we see a risk and clear signs of increased market concentration and leading to less uh, and not more competition um, and locking out not only small publishers, but also innovative, including fully open access publishers, vendor lock-in, um, curtailing author choice and perpetuation of the hybrid um, of the hybrid model. So the concern is that at some point, if there is no transition towards which these transformative agreements move. Um, the concept of transformative agreement starts looking more like some kind of transformation washing. That these effects, which have been described in the EUA uh, study and other recent studies, I think someone needs to mute <laughs> their microphone, uh, apologies. Um, uh, so the, the, the concern is that these effects, which have also been described in the, in the UA study, uh, are not part of a short transition, but rather a perpetuation of the old dysfunctional system uh, for years to come. Uh, but they, that they are washed behind a, a positive terminology of transformative agreements. And these are not only theoretical effects. I mean, we witness them on a daily basis as a fully open access publisher. We see that authors feel pressure to publish with legacy publishers under a transformative agreement because for the author, it looks like it's for free. But of course, it isn't uh, for free. 
Um, and library consortia have to prioritize current deals and uh, have very little budget and time left uh, to negotiate with smaller publishers and uh, open access publishers. So how do we avoid the risk of transformative agreements unintentionally perpetuating that which we aim to change? The best approach um, is to stick to the principles that transformative agreements need to be transitional and temporary. And as Plan S already does, by providing a deadline of 2024, after which the funders will no longer support publication fees of journals covered by transformative agreements. Um, and this is exactly what Sweden has recently announced, that the Swedish higher education institutions will not renew transformative agreements once they expire in 2024, because they are supposed to be transitional arrangements. More institutions and more countries would need to do this when their current agreements expire and in the future insist on 100% open access and full cost transparency. This would mean that licensing budgets could finally be used to cover open access publishing costs with all publishers who offer 100% open access uh, solutions, regardless of the historical uh, business model of that publisher. And this is an essential point. Uh, di directly relevant to EUA members and, and all higher education institutions, being able to use the same budget to pay for agreements with legacy publishers and for covering publishing costs of open access publishers means that the same conditions can be applied to all providers, generating real competition and fostering diversity in the publishing market. Uh, it also adds transparency to the system because institutions have better oversight of what is being paid, to whom and for what services. And bottom line, that's what you want as an institution. What is your spend? What is the total cost of publishing versus what are you paying in, in terms of APCs uh, for open access? Now, fully open access publishers like Frontiers also have agreements with higher uh, education institutions. These have all the benefits of publish and read and read and publish agreements, plus the extra benefits of 100% open access. So there is no read fee and there is no extra costs for transformation. There is no need to transform what is already fully open access. Um, and we, we at Frontiers, we're very proud to have over 250 such memberships, uh, uh, membership agreements with over 500 institutions and to have signed some of the first open access national agreements um, ever. This kind of agreement with fully open access publishers help provide more choice to authors to increase diversity in publishing and increase cost efficiency. And ultimately, they are a way to balance the strong focus on transformation of the old system to open access with, by supporting the part of the system that doesn't need transformation and thus avoid the risk of transformation washing. Um, that transformative agreements end up perpetuating the status quo, which is the opposite of what the term transformative should imply. And we forget the end goal, which was always to transform the system as a whole. So thank you very much. Thank you, Stefan. So interesting, critical. So that's a nice way to start maybe the conversation. Can I ask all panelists to uh, come back and turn on uh, their cameras so that uh, everybody now can, can see you all? And can I then also insist that uh, the uh, question and answers uh, is uh, now starting? Of course, I've got a whole list of questions to ask to uh, all of our panelists. But what we really want to have also is the opportunity for you, uh, the audience, to be able to ask uh, questions. So feel free to use the Q&A uh, option that you have actually uh, with, the, uh, with the platform. Uh, let me start in going back to what Stefan was saying about being quite, uh, quite critical. And you, know, you were mentioning the perpetuating of the, uh, the current system, the market concentration, uh, the, the, the lockout of the small, the vendor locking, et cetera. Uh, I'd be quite curious to, to hear that, you know, what the others are thinking, because I mean, this is really what this webinar is about. Is this trans, are these transformative agreements, meaning transformation? I think all of you have said positive things about it, uh, but also were uh, somewhat cautious. I'm, I'm, I'm curious to hear from, from all of you, uh, are they here to stay or are they really here to be transformed into something else? And if it is the case, uh, you know, how will they be become uh, really transformative? Uh, I don't know who, who wants to start. We could, we could go back to uh, Jens Peter because you were the first one to speak. Uh, do, do, what would you say to this? And what uh, would you say also to the criticism that Stefan has highlighted? Mm. Thanks. Oh, great discussion. I, oh, I hope we won't run, be running out of time, but I'll be, try to be short. Um, so um, 
the whole thing is not a black and white thing. It's absolutely clear. It's a, it's a gray area and that makes it um, really demanding and uh, also interesting. Um, uh, Stefan, thanks for, for your critical remarks. I mean, I can tell from the large German system that um, it is absolutely not undisputed the way the deal consortium is going. Um, to make that perfectly clear, it's not a monolithic view on that thing in the sense that everyone says, yes, it's the best solution, let's go. We have also very clear voices in the library community and uh, from the scientist, scientific side, uh, which are saying that um, especially um, that two issues. Um, one is the, in the monopoly issues. I'll comment on that uh, in a few seconds. And, and the first one is to say, um, is the parfi, is the concept of a parfi, is it not the wrong one? Is it not just a perpetuation of the old system? We should have jumped directly into a pure open access fee system. There's still, this is still an ongoing um, uh, discussion in the German community. The problem is a bit size matters. So we had to, for, for a large and hugely diverse system, we had to get to find a solution together with, with uh, Wiley and Springer Nature in these cases to, to start a, from our point of view, a transformation. Um, and so we had to find a kind of common ground to move on. And so we decided to go with the PARFI model, but it's in no way absolutely undisputed, but there has, has been and still is a lot of criticism about that. I'm, I'm saying that so explic uh, explicitly because um, uh, it, for us it is really important and also very problematic not to appear to be a kind of machine going on without looking left or right and hearing no criticism. This is absolutely not the case. But as we have that highly diverse system, we had to, you know, enter into a kind of basic understanding and then move along. So that's what we're doing at the moment. But the points that Stefan um, raised are very valid. And maybe I could add to what Stefan said and also what, what Liz said to the, to, to the monopoly issue. Um, that would be my last remark. Um, when we started deal uh, in let's say 2014, late uh, late 2014, 2015, um, one of the main driving forces what was that we saw within our library uh, budgets that there was um, almost no money left to have contracts with small publishers because everything went to the big three one. I'm simplifying here, but so uh, it, uh, to, to to enable diversity again was one of the driving forces. I'm not saying that we will we're perfect in in reaching that solution. Um, we will see how it turns out. It's 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 really a tough issue, but this was one of the driving forces to break these monopolies and uh, to give more room to the libraries again and more let's say, money again, to enter into contracts with smaller publishers. We'll see how it works out, but this is really uh, a serious criticism which we um, have, uh, let's say, on the front of our, on the, t on the tip of our tongues. Thank you. So a really transformative, but also learning uh, transition that, that you're talking about. Good, I'll, I'll ask a question to all of you, but I want to go to, to Jack and maybe spin it a bit differently based on a question from, uh, mm -hmm. sorry if I, I say it wrong, uh, Jodranka. Slojanovsky, who's asking you also specifically about those transformative agreements and how are they actually supporting uh, innovation? So uh, that's really uh, to you specifically that uh, it was asked, Jack. Um, they are, well, um, a, a bit like the kind of the point I was making earlier is that they have, they have carved out a space for innovation, further information and transformation is possible. Um, so uh, two years ago with IRL, you know, open access wasn't really part of our spend and it wasn't really kind of on the agenda. We were solely focused on the read side of things. Now a sizable part of our budget is for open access and it's locked, it's not locked in with any particular open access model. It's, we're, we're kind of primarily focusing on kind of on read and publish and transformative models at the moment. But when deep point agreements are up for renewal in a few years time, um, that will all be kind of, uh, called into question. So um we are kind of open and eager to exploring other um open access and open scholarship models and so th that that percentage of our budget will be able to kind of en enable and facilitate that okay 
So the transformative agreement themselves lending support actually to further innovation within uh, within that landscape. Okay, great. Uh, Claire, uh, turning to you now, and also you know still about those criticism, you were highly positive uh, ab ab about the transformative agreement. So how do you answer actually to those criticism that uh, that Stefan but others all also raised because that was false, also followed by by Jens Peter, and more specifically with you. Uh, you know, the company of biologists flipped uh, three journals to transformative ones. And, you know, you set a timeline for transformation. So that's quite interesting. So, you know, what what sort of, of, of uh, timeline did you set and what were your targets uh, in there? OK, I'll start with maybe a fairly general point, which is that it's about author choice. So, um, you know, we have to listen to our authors and what they want. And, you know, um, Europe has focused very strongly on gold OA, but that's not the case everywhere. And um, so they made it clear to us that they wanted to continue with three choices for the time being, which was that they can publish non-OA, which is completely free of any charge. Um, we've always had um, uh, free publishing through that route. They can choose open access and they can pay an APC, or if they have a read and publish agreement, then they can use that agreement to publish without paying a fee. And those three choices were still really important to our authors. And that's one of the reasons that we've gone for the transformative journal approach is that we can maintain those three options for authors as we help them. And I think that the read and publish agreements help them to choose open access by taking the, the money complication away, away from the author. Um, so you also talked about the timeline. So uh, we have focused quite a lot on Plan S, um, you know, behind our strategy. And um, through that um, approach, the transformative journals are compliant until the end of 2024. So we would be looking to make some decisions in 2025. And um, you're, you're, I'm going to go back to your point about me sounding positive. I think that one of the things I found as a publisher is that having transformative journals I can be really positive about open access publishing. One of the um, commitments is to promote open access publishing and uh, to, to explain the benefits to our authors. So it's about give, making it easier for them to choose it, but also promoting why they should choose it. So I think those are both very positive. And um, you know, the company of biologists is going to be 100 years old in 2025. So when we come to the point of making some decisions about flipping, well, I can't make any definite um, promises. I can say that we feel very positive about making some um, celebratory announcements and that we really do hope that that's the way that we're going. Thank you. And I see that Claire disappeared. I hope she's still Liz. with us. <laughs> oh, sorry, uh, Liz disappeared. Yeah. <laughs> I hope she's still with us. If not, well, that, my next question was going to be to her, obviously, as the last one to answer to Stefan. But then, Stefan, in the meantime, let me ask you a question, because um, I we received actually questions, specific one uh, directed to you from uh, Katerina. Uh, and she says that not all Frontiers Journal listed in Scopus or Web of Science, so which may discourage institutions uh, from signing agreements. What are your plans in this respect? So that's a very specific question for you. Uh, maybe not just about transformative agreement, but maybe uh, to fit in there too. Um, yeah, so it, it, it's a very specific question about uh, why some journals are not listed on the Web of Science or, or Scopus. Um, as far as I'm aware, um, all of our journals, but the very newest ones, the very youngest uh, journals are listed there. Uh, and that has to do uh, uh, with two things. On the one hand, uh, we wait uh, a few months until we have a, a critical number of articles published in new journals and mature those journals before submitting them and registering them with uh, uh, registries like Web of Science, Scopus, uh, and also DOAJ. And then on the side of these uh, of these registries, they have policies where they uh, wait a, a certain amount of time or a, a certain critical mass of articles before uh, registering a, a journal. Um, so um, I'd have to check if there are individual exceptions to that, but as far as I know, all journals that have a certain age, um, and in my mind, it's all the, the newest ones, um, the most recent titles, those launched uh, basically since the beginning of this year, all others should be listed there for sure. Okay, thanks for answering that. And that gave time for Liz to come back, so wonderful. Um, so, uh, Liz, I mean, now the question to you, obviously, Stefan raised several points. It was, you know, about monopoly, market concentration, 
uh, lock out of the small players, which again, you know, it's not directly uh, maybe to be answered by you, but vendor locking uh, might be. And maybe also the perpetuation of the, the hybrid. So how do you see that? And as they are transformative, and we hear about a deadline of 2024, and we heard Claire talking about, you know, what they'll do about, about it in 2025. So what's your position at Wiley? And what, what do you see happening uh, in the future, but more specifically with the deadline of 2025 then? Okay, thanks. Um, and thanks for the patience with home Wi-Fi networks. Um, uh, one of the points that, that Professor Gold made in his opening statement was that you needed strong leadership to see this kind of development through. Um, one of the, the things that I think, I hope we made clear with the deal group um, back in the late 20 teens was that Wiley was committed to finding a way forward in the open access transition. I definitely see transformative agreements as part of that transitional stage. I do think they have a time limit to them. Um, when and where that time limit comes to an end is the really tricky point, that there are going to be certain consortia, certain customer groups, certain researcher groups who are ready before others. Europe is definitely ahead of the curve. There are some strong outliers in other parts of the world as well. But one of, one of the challenges is, is that not everyone is moving at the same pace. And, and the one bit I did hear from Claire before the signal just dropped was that we have to serve the needs of researchers everywhere. Um, and as they and their institutions and their funders come on stream at different paces, there are going to be implications for transitional agreements. I don't know whether it was discussed when I was out. I, I know about the, the moves within Sweden and the desire for pure publish. I can totally understand from the perspective of groups in that situation why having supported subscriptions and hybrid for four years followed by transition for several years that they are ready for the next thing and what I would say is that if we all make the assumption that we are moving from a state in which subscription and hybrid is the dominant model to one in which OA is the dominant model the trickiest part of this is going to be the transitional period it's not going to be the beginning point or the end point. There will be tricky bits in there. It's how we navigate these intervening years. And what I what I sense and what I hope will continue to be the case is that we come at this by trying to work together to figure out what those next steps must be. Every one of the agreements that we've struck to date, from our perspective, builds on the experience of the ones that have gone before and is slightly different and changed. And I believe that to be true often on the part of the, the institutions that we're working with as well, that they're bringing to the table the evidence and the experience that they've got from pre-existing transitional agreements. Things like having the contracts openly available means that everyone can, at least if they have the appetite to wade their way through 45 pages of often quite technical stuff, can see what others have done and try to learn and move on from those. So we are going to be in a period of change for some time. That is not the same saying that hybrid will be perpetuated. This is about how more of the system moves in a bigger, faster and more concerted way. Um, I didn't in my opening remarks make one remark that I often do, which is just how long some of these agreements take to make. Claire said that. Jack showed that coming to the table with clear determination to get stuff done in a short space of time means it can happen. I think the pace of acceleration will pick up. I do think we will see contracts that are absolutely dominated by publish post-2024. I also know, though, that there is still a lot of subscription content out there that isn't going to move at that same pace. And that's where I don't have a concrete answer. Does Read and Publish exaggerate any sense of market dominance? I don't believe so, but I do think that if publishers of any shape and size are behaving in a way that is consistent with where research institutions, research funders and researchers want to go, then those are the publishers of whatever shape and size that should be um, should be providing services that are valued and valuable to people. Okay, and, and jumping on, to, on that, Jack, you mentioned actually 
uh, how the value of the work of a few that work a lot actually is, mm -hmm. is instrumental actually in bringing open access. And you were saying how the transformative agreement has changed completely the landscape. But, but going back to this deadline of 2024 and the transformation then, do you think this is realistic when, when you see, and, and Jens Peter, prepare for this, because I want to hear from the two consortium people, uh, people who have actually negotiated those from your side. Do you see this 2024 uh, timeline as realistic? And I'll jump on the question to be very concrete from Jean-Claude Bergelman. We all know him. He used to be the open access champion at, at the European Commission. He says, it is correct to say that open access publishing is on the rise and in absolute terms, it looks spectacular, but is it the same proportionally? So uh, in view of you know, being fully open access by 2024. So Jack first. Yeah, um, well, a couple of ways um, that transformative agreements are, or transitional agreements can adapt um, if we're still negotiating them in, in three to five years time uh, when the um, the Plan S uh, prohibition on publishing in hybrid journals as part of a transformative agreement kicks in. Um, something I was looking into the other day was, say, with uh, with one particular publisher that we work with, we, we know that um, X percent of our articles in the hybrid journals with them are, uh, fund are uh, Plan S funded. So what we can do uh, in, in three to five years time is when we're renegotiating with those publishers, um, negotiate, kind of design the agreement around a smaller number of uh, papers in compliant journals only. Um, another way we can deal with with, uh, with the next round of transformative agreements is to look on the read side. So uh, Heather Pivovar has um, a, a well-known um, paper recently uh, suggesting that by around 2025, we reach a tipping point where the majority of article readership uh, will be to open access articles. So we will start to see it as a decline in the value of closed content then. And uh, Pivovar's company Unsub offers kind of um, more advanced analytical tools to help us judge the value of, clo of closed access uh, read subscriptions. So they will heavily come into play um, in negotiating the, particularly the read side of uh, publish, uh, read and publish agreements and, and, and possibly may lead to um, uh, publish only agreements uh, with uh, tr traditional publishers or perhaps um, read and publish agreements with a very much reduced selective uh, subscription side to it. And uh, Jens Peter, uh, same to you, but uh, you also mentioned uh, in your introduction the added value versus cheaper, and also uh, indicators for cost control. So in that, you know, how do you see the transition? Again, I'm putting back to you the 2024 deadline, how realistic uh, as you mm. see the transformation happening. But the importance also of those two notions, uh, the, the, the cost control indicators and the added value versus cheap also. Again, maybe a lot of stuff I'm putting to you, but uh, quite key. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Stefan. I, I try to, to, uh, to muddle through. Um, to put it bluntly, the, the, the 2024 deadline is, um, from the perspective of the German system, is relatively abstract date because we are a large system. Um, everyone pointed it out um, and, and Liz rightfully said, I mean, we have 900 eligible institutions for these contracts, around 900. So, um, including 400 universities, the Max Planck Society, Fraunhofer, Helmholtz, Leibniz, um, a lot of um, uh, research organizations already dedicated or directly dedicated to the federal government or to the lender government. So, so it's a hugely diverse uh, landscape, which is moving in many, many different paces. Like we have not like two different paces, but like 10 or 20, something like that. So our our rough planning would be um, would be that we we need at least um, kind of a second wave for the three big contracts, and we don't have three already. We're we're, we're ending. The, the, um, we are we're, we're moving towards the, the the formal end of the first contract with Wiley at the end of this year. Um, there's an option to, to go on for one more year, but we, we don't have a contract with, with Elsevier. Uh, everyone is aware of that. But in our, in our rough planning, but this is not like formalized scenario where you can find um, uh, some decision on it, but the rough planning says we, we would need at least 
uh, one more um, wave of these contracts, a second Wiley contract, a second Springer Nature contract, a second Elsevier contract, till we can move near the final open access world if something like that exists. I, I have, um, I would like to point out that, I mean, if you look at the contracts, um, I think Liz would agree to say that we both had, or both organizations or both sides had to take a steep learning curve to, together at the beginning um, in all aspects, but it turned out quite nicely at the end. But we, that, that was a really tough thing and that a lot of work had to put into that. So if you look um, at that contract or compare it with the second contract, the Springer Nature contract, um, these contracts are not identical. There are, there are huge differences between them. And if we're talking about an Elsevier contract, for example, we have no um, overall contract with Elsevier now for many years. And this is a big change also in the attitude of uh, the institutions in Germany. So a third contract, um, maybe one with Elsevier, would maybe look completely different in scope, in mechanisms and so on from the contracts we had before. So I would be very careful to say that um, there is a clear defined scenario and now it's transition time, step one, step two, and well, here's the wonderful open access world. But this will be a slow process with different elements combined and it might go on for uh, at least longer than two, uh, 2024. I, I'll talk about like a process about like five to 10 years um, where we do that and Novo can say what, what happens after that. So um, I would be um, maybe a bit Maybe my perspective is a bit like um, marked or spoiled by the large and diverse German system, but as it is a big system in in, in Europe, uh, it's it's a it's a valid perspective. So I, I'll leave yeah. it with that for the first. And some are even calling for European wide consortium. So you can imagine then how how much wider we're talking about. Yeah, that uh, would let's be go back. Let's go back to, to, to Stefan, who started this whole discussion also with the 2024 deadline. And, and really, in your case, it's quite different. Frontier is an open access publisher. So you know, there's no need to flip anything uh, because you were never subscription-based. So yet you have national and institutional agreements. So can you tell us more about that model and how you fit in the, in the whole picture then? Sure. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm quite aware that I'm in the comfortable position of being able to to criticize uh, and not as an open access publisher, like you said, we ourselves, we don't have this kind of agreement. We don't need them. We already uh, transform. Um, I, I just want to make a point uh, to what Jens said. I mean, of course, I understand the complexity of this in a system like Germany is, is huge. Yeah? Um, so I think it's not a surprise to anyone, but maybe the most naive uh, of us <laughs> who thought, you know, 2024 as a hard deadline. Uh, and it's, it's nice actually to hear for once, a, 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 a precise figure, or you know, at least a window with five to, to ten years, and, and to hear you speak of a second uh, wave, because of course this is what we all suspected um, you know, was the case. Um, uh, but we, we 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 do have to all be aware, and I I, I know that you are aware. But the, the, we are talking about public money um, and and uh, and about you know policy goals that we we are throwing this public money towards. Um, and if we, you know, if we keep, keep kicking the can down the road, um, uh, we are going to get into a situation uh, that is just no longer uh, tolerable. Um, now to the question, of course, uh, as I mentioned also in my introduction, open access publishers also have agreements to offer. And we also do sign agreements and institutions are uh, uh, in, in some cases very willing to enter discussions with us uh, about these agreements. And um, so we, we offer all of the benefits of the uh, of a publish and read or read and publish agreement, uh, we earn. Uh, we we offer terms agreed centrally with the consortium or with the, a single institution. Uh, various central payment mechanisms to choose from, uh, and as I mentioned, we also at Frontiers we offer an annualized uh, payment uh, program, uh, dedicated ver verification process to ensure that central libraries remain in full control, so full transparency reporting. Um, uh, to the to the institutions and to the consortia, equal benefits to the members of the of all the members of the consortium, full transparency on the agreed terms of conditions. Uh, uh, all our agreements are published; um, they are publicly, uh, you know, everyone can 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 see them. It also means that we cannot offer some conditions to some partners and other and different conditions to others. Uh, and, and I think this is a big part of. Uh, uh, 
open access, and it's a big part towards which we should be moving with transformative agreements, is that um, uh, you know things like non-disclosure um, uh, clauses disappear. We certainly don't have that kind of thing. All of our contracts are, are published. Um, and um, uh, so this is a central part. And if there is one redeeming feature of transformative agreements, um, it is the rise of a service like ISAC, for example, a registry where at least you start having an idea of uh, what is out there. Um, and of course, registration of, of a transformative agreement in ISAC is voluntary, but uh, we, 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 we do see, and especially the new service that they've launched, the Market Watch, is really a, a, an amazing service. And looking at those figures, um, I mean, of the 300, I think it's exactly 300 agreements that are currently registered on, on ISAC. Only six are with publishers that publish less than a thousand papers per year, so really small publishers. Huh? Um, the large majority of, um, I mean, some are with, uh, I would say, uh, say medium-sized publishers, but the large majority of the agreements are with, with the traditional large, small group of large publishers. Um, and if I had one input or suggestion to the ESAC people, I really love your 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 infrastructure, your your service is you should start registering fully open access uh, agreements as well so that they become comparable and people can you know use a feature like the the market watch on isaac and immediately see uh, also what is the impact of fully open access uh, agreements and which calls then to turn to you claire because in a sense uh, you must have concerns for the future you were talking about you know your visibility and the work it represents for for you guys as, as a small publisher and and someone made a comment about you know the vendor locking which is not something that was not a purpose uh, with the transformative agreements from the the big publishers but it just happens because why would a researcher at a university you know that has a transformative uh, agreement or in a consortium go to you if they don't have a transformative agreement so what's you know do you have concerns about what's what's happening and and how do you plan to deal with that actually yeah i think there's so much unknown isn't there i think the other thing that we haven't really discussed is that there are research intensive universities and there are read intensive universities and the subscription pricing was based on you know readership and um, the open access model is based on publishing. So, you know, that sort of means that in theory, there would be winners and losers in terms of institutions. Um, I think that um, you're, you're absolutely right. We are concerned about being a small organization. Um, we've gone out there and tried to be as loud as possible so that um, people, um, and, and they have, they've, they've come to us and said, yes, you know, you're trying to do the right thing. So we're going to work with you and help you. Um, but, it is hard and you know certainly with consortia if each of the agreements is different that's a huge amount of work um I, there's there's an appetite both from librarians and from publishers to try to work towards um a simple template um but i i have to say you know don't want to sound too uh, too gloomy but i think that's a really um hard thing to achieve um because everybody does want something that's quite different so I think that people really want to look for ways to make this easier, um, but are struggling to um, cope with the scale of the of the issue. Thanks. And we're going to have, unfortunately, to wrap up very soon. But before we do, uh, we've got, it's interesting in any way, we've got uh, STM, so the representative of publishers, who has come to us and they want to talk about uh, VAT. And so turning to you, Jack, and you, uh, Jens Peter, maybe first, I wanted to have your views. They're very, I mean, the transformative agreement and the, you know, the, the deals that you have now is transforming the way that VAT is affecting actually also, because you've got different rates between different countries. So of course you're coming from two different countries, but have you started speaking about this with others in other uh, countries in, in Europe? And do you see this as, as something that's affecting potentially very strongly the way that tr those transformative agreements are being, uh, are being uh, negotiated? I don't know, Jack or Jens, uh, Peter, who wants to start? Jack? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I've discussed this with uh, with peers in other um, consortium, and uh, the experience in Ireland is similar to a lot of um, uh, European consortia in that there's different VAT rates for um, subscriptions and for open access publishing. So in Ireland, it's uh, a lower nine percent VAT for subscriptions and a higher uh, twenty three percent VAT for open access publishing services. And 
this works against us in a way that our ultimate aim is to shift the money to open access publishing, access publishing. But in our short term interests, um, this is costing us more money. And I think ultimately, kind of the, the only solution to this is to push either at a European level or at a national level, at least, for um, the open access publishing to move down to that lower level on par. Yeah. Thanks, Peter. If you also spoke yeah. about this. Yeah. With, uh, more or less same effect here. We have the strange situation that we have, uh, as we have the publish and read fee, uh, both parts of that fee have different VATs on it. Um, for And uh, this uh, is simply producing costs because um, it means that, um, you know, every billing we're doing um, has to be like two-parted. And uh, this is um, something we've, we started talking with our authorities about. Um, also arguing that uh, it will be a problem in international cooperation and international competition. Uh, but we've not come very far with that issue um, to date yet. But um, it's, it's a strong point. We have to change that in the long run. Okay. Very quick uh, on this uh, Liz, Claire, or Stefan. I, I don't know if you uh, you guys have been from your side actually how you can help with that potentially. It's it's a very difficult one. I'd, I'd say, and and I we experience a number of the same administrative challenges here in dealing with the authorities on on VAT issues on on publishing activity versus reading activity, and it is one of those factors that, as well as making existing agreements really complicated from time to time it can also be one of the factors that holds up agreements from even happening as different VAT jurisdictions apply different treatments or consider different things if, if if there's anything we can all do to work together on i think this is one area where we would all be very grateful to help solve each other's problems okay good unfortunately we're going to have to wrap up so now i'm going to give each one of you just one minute and i'll be really tough on that one uh, and the way I want to finish this is, uh, you know, we're, we've talked all along about this being transformative. We are in a transition. So things are evolving all the time and you're learning all the time about that. Could you tell me what are your one or two targets for the next few years? And what are your one or two emerging trends that you see really coming that are different from what we've seen so far? So one or two targets and one or two trends, actually, that you're seeing emerging right now. And uh, let's keep the same order. So Jens Peter, unfortunately, you first. <laughs> oh, no, you caught me off guard. Um, I, I'll try to make it up in, in, in one minute. Um, our target would be um, to close the speed gaps we have diagnosed. So we have these different paces in, in the, the huge German system and um, we, we try to close the gaps in the speed between the different groups because that would make it much easier to perform and to have like a strong voice for the upcoming, let's call it second wave of, of new contracts we have to, to think about. That would be, I think, the main, uh, the main point. The, 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 the overall acceptance thing for a movement towards open access is not, I would dare to say, is not a really big issue in Germany because there's a, such a strong push towards open a, uh, access. So we have a kind of uh, strong support from the uh, community on that. So that would be um, the target to get things a bit smoother in our diverse system. And um, it's out. so quickly, a trend? Um, a trend would be um, uh, to to um, a trend would be to say to to stop thinking in these categories. This is purely transitional, and this is kind of um, the real thing. So so to be able to be flexible between to move uh, for the greater good of the community uh, between these let's say two poles. Okay, thanks a lot, Jack. Your target and your uh, trend. Yeah, um, a lot of uh, what I was intending to say has been covered already. So ju just to summarize, I think um, what I'd like to see happening would be something that IRL Consortium has shown can be done is a growth of transformative agreements beyond the, the top 10 publishers to, to work with with a, kind of a wider variety of, uh, of publishers. And also to see, um, including IRL um, Consortium being more um, diverse in how they spend their, their, their open access money in exploring and supporting um, alternative models such as subscribe to open diamond or platinum open access um, to kind of a kind of work past the, the bridgehead of transformative agreements into a kind of a genuinely diverse 
and um, more innovative um, uh, e ecosystem for scholarly publishing. Thank you. And as always, you, you are shorter the time I assign you. Thank you so much for doing that. Liz, you're next. What's okay. your target at Wiley actually, or maybe yourself, but in terms of those transformative agreement and maybe beyond, as we've heard, it's not just about transformative agreement. And then also, what do you see emerging among those discussions you're having with, uh, with, with the consortiums uh, out there? Okay, so our, our target absolutely is also to deliver on more transformative agreements um, and to make them easier and faster to negotiate for all parties and to execute and to implement. We have a target to make the implementation of those agreements as successful as they can be and as smooth as they can be for all concerned. So a lot of focus on services to researchers, but also to these very few pairs of broad shoulders that Jack referenced that a lot of the administration falls onto. Um, I, I want to be explicit that our goal here is to ensure open access to the version of record. That's a really important piece for us in maintaining integrity in the system and maintaining the importance of peer review as we go through this transition to full open access. Um, we also want to make sure that we can help bring others with us as well. Um, Wiley is a, a publisher that also provides services to some. So making sure that the services that we provide that are standalone and separate to perhaps a widely negotiated agreement are, are suited to partners and who and others who are also looking for the transition to OA. And we're also looking forward to a future of more pure open access in and of itself. Um, there was a, a small announcement about the acquisition of Hindawi oh, yeah. just through Christmas. Um, but this is also about investment in our own open access growth and those for our societies as well. And absolutely, I see a trend of greater collaboration. And I'm going to have to stop you there. Clara, your turn. <laughs> one target and one emerging trend. Oh, I'm going to do two targets, more read and publish agreements. And obviously our, our sort of bottom line is 5% growth in open access um, articles each year. Um, the trends, much more transparent metrics and comparative metrics between open access and subscription content. And just to echo the collaboration, um, for example, a, a, um, a, a number of, in fact, I think it's around 100 now, small not-for-profit publishers have come together to form the Society Publishers Coalition to try to help each other through what is obviously a very difficult process. So I think, you know, and I think a more collaboration with librarians, um, I think, that although there is, of course, still a financial transaction, I think that we're all trying to move in the same direction to benefit authors and researchers. Thank you very much. And uh, last words to you, Stefan, then. What's your conclusion with your target at Frontiers and uh, the emerging trend that, that uh, you're, you're starting to see up here? Um, well, our target is, as I said, more agreements with open access publishers, not only with Frontiers, but in general, uh, sign more of these kind of agreements with open access publishers. Um, also, uh, another target for us is to continue to show that open access works. It works at scale. It works if you do it as your only business model. And it also is also commercially viable. Um, so uh, I think uh, open access really allows for a diversity of publishers uh, of different business models, non-profit, for-profit, to provide a, a high quality service. That's the target to keep showing that. The worrying trends that we see that contrast that is, uh, what Liz alluded to it, um, the acquisition of open access publishers by, um, by large subscription publishers. Uh, on the one hand, of course, it's great. It allows you to grow your open access portfolio. On the other hand, it, it does reduce further the diversity of publishers that are out there. Um, so, so that is something that we look towards um, uh, with some, some concern and some worry. Okay, thank you very much. And, and again, thanks to you all. I'm not even gonna try to summarize, except for one element probably. And that is certainly the fact that uh, it is a learning period. It is indeed a transition period. And so uh, certainly at EUA, we thank you all panelists for allowing to come in this transition period to share your thoughts and where you are. And we, sh we will not keep it to this. Uh, we will continue. The work of our scholarly publishing uh, subgroup is also continuing. And I hope we can uh, have this conversation again in a year or two to see where we're at. So with that, thank you so much to all the panelists. 
uh, for having accepted to come and, and discuss. Unfortunately, we only scratched the surface. Thanks also to the members of the program committee, uh, the EUA expert group on science 2.0 and open science, but also the group of negotiators in the steering committee uh, of the read and publish uh, study. A special thanks to my colleagues who made this webinar possible at the EUA secretariat, in particular, uh, particular Vincent Gaillard, Rita Morris, Ori, uh, uh, Moraes, uh, Aurélie Clenet, and our former colleague also, Leonard Storch. So, uh, importantly, other EUA webinars and events are coming. I mentioned earlier that on the 15th of June, there will be the one on Let's Get Practical. That's the fourth of this series of webinar. Uh, and this will be about aligning institutional policies with Plan S. So you can go and register uh, for that. Uh, also, uh, please make sure that you save the date for the 8th of July. We have the Open Science Survey uh, that is coming out, and we will have a special webinar specifically de dedicated to, on the Open Science Survey. Of course, all this information is available online on our website. Once again, thank you to all five of you. Much appreciated. And uh, I look forward to having our next conversation on transformative agreements or whatever they will have become by then. Thank you very much. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. A pleasure. Thank you. Thanks Thank a lot. You. Thank yep. you very much. Bye bye.